So after years of studying the book, uh, Think and Grow Rich, I've come to the awareness that there were really three principles that helped me apply that philosophy and literally do the promise of what Napoleon Hill said, to be able to think and grow rich. And the three missing principles are forgiveness, tithing, and love. And I wrote this book to share my story of these principles and how I came to, to learn them and then later apply them to the original text of Thinking We're Rich. It, it begins at 430 Coolidge Avenue in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, the, the home of my upbringing, a house of terror for my three siblings and me. In my many years of teaching in the field of personal growth and human potential, I've been hesitant to share the details of these early years of my life lest it hit a nerve with you and also to protect the person who was the primary cause of the terror inflicted on my siblings and me. Quite frankly, the details would give chills to even the most cold-hearted of individuals. So at the risk of causing undue pain, let me bear a piece of my heart to you in hopes that it will open your eyes, your heart, and your mind to a deeper level of awareness of the secrets that I've discovered to, to seek and to share with you within the subsequent chapters to provide my own perspective, trusting that it will be a tuning fork that resonates to your truth and awakens with you an understanding of who and whose you are. 430 Coolidge Avenue was a house of terror. It was the impoverished home of a single mom, my mother and her four children, Jeannie, Tom, David and me. My father left my mother when she was three months pregnant with me when looking from the outside, it was like any other middle class home, actually in one of the wealthier suburbs just outside of the city of Pittsburgh. But as we all know, looks can be deceiving. And although I know pieces of my mother's story, and I know that she experienced a very difficult and troubled upbringing, one where she was harmed, she was neglected, she was bullied and abused. I still cannot in any way fully fathom how and why she perpetrated that same level of abuse on my three siblings and me. No matter the difficulties of one's childhood, that can never provide excuse for a person to perpetrate any degree of harm on another human being. As an adult now, I, I see children with their parents. I see the love expressed from mother and father to child. And it's inconceivable to me how any human being could be capable of exacting pain and terror upon someone as innocent as a child. But indeed, my mother was capable. As I was going through the, the shopping malls in the month of December, as people were celebrating and getting ready to celebrate Christmas, just that quick, you know, a memory would flash into my mind as I would see a, a mom with her young kid. And I would think back of how I wished <laughs> my childhood would have been. How I wish that, you know, I would have felt the same kind of love and joyful kind of expectation that those kids were feeling. See, these, these old memories never go away. And that I think is really the power of the principle of forgiveness is forgiveness is a lifetime journey. And I explain a, a process of forgiveness in these chapters. I have memories of lying in my bed as a small boy of four or five years of age, hearing my mother raging in the kitchen below, breaking every dish in the house. And I would just lie there, staring into the pitch black of my bedroom, my stomach beginning to tie itself in anxious knots, sometimes wetting the bed from fear, dreading the inevitable sound of her storming up the stairs toward the rooms where my siblings and I were cringing in our beds. And she would beat us. Not every day, but enough days to feel those emotions right now as I write and literally read as a 54-year-old man. I would come home from school and I would never know what person I would meet on the other side of that front door. Some days she was loving and doting, promising to, to make us cookies or to play with us, promises that were almost always unkept. And other days, the person I encountered inside my home had no resemblance to what a mother should be. She was dark and distant. My little mind could feel with its intuition the rage that she had boiling and building inside her as she would lie on the couch not saying a word, just fuming. And we would resign ourselves to waiting for the inevitable explosion, trying not to make a sound lest 
we'd be the cause of it. You know, in the book, the original text, Seeking Grow Rich, Napoleon Hill dedicates an entire chapter to this power of intuition, our ability, a sixth sense, our ability to kind of sense our environment. And truly, I think this is one of the things that I've been able to harvest the good from, from my life. As, as a child of abuse, I learned to really tune into the frequency of my environment. I learned to work a room. I could, I can remember just thinking back to my brother Tom, my brother David, and trying to managing, kind of managing all of our energy, making sure that there weren't any fights going on so that my mother wouldn't be triggered. Trying to manage how things were going to flow in the home and being able to read everybody's energy. Because I just, I just knew that there were, there would be just a little thing that could trigger it if I could prevent that, that I would try to do. And so in one way, I'm grateful for the childhood that I've had. And you know, that's part of forgiveness is can you harvest some good? Can you, can you pull something from that? And that's one thing that I've been able to say is that being a child of abuse gave me a level of intuition, really the need to develop my intuitive factor in probably a way that no other lesson in life could have. I remember one winter's night waking up to my mother pulling me by my hair out of bed and dragging me down the steps, my body flailing side to side, hitting the walls as I would try to grab onto the hand railing to stop her. And with the other hand, kind of holding her hand tight against my head so she wouldn't rip my hair out of my scalp. Once we hit the bottom landing, it was the slide across the living room carpet and then onto the cold linoleum floor. I can still remember thanking God for the slippery surface of the linoleum as my small body could be dragged along more quickly, making my time held in her grasp shorter. And then I was tossed through the aluminum storm door and out onto the snow and ice-covered back porch. You know, winter time in Pittsburgh is cold. It's freezing, in fact. She would throw my siblings and me outside, threatening to lock us out until one of us confessed the supposed misdeed of moving her comb set. Although I couldn't say how long we were really out there, it felt like hours huddling together in the blistering cold. It was all we could do to try to share our body heat, to, to keep each other warm and alive. There we were, three small boys, ages five, nine, and 11. My sister had already left to live with my grandparents after my mother's sometime lived in lover tried to sexually assault her, but that's a, that's a different story. In shock, freezing, too scared to call out for help and too frightened to dare raise a defense. Pray, maybe, maybe not. I'm not sure if silent begging is the same as prayer. Holidays for children of abuse are not filled with joyful expectation. They are filled with fear. One of my mother's favorite go-to forms of abuse was the build up and let down scenario. She would build our hopes up for something and take great joy in retracting it from us. I remember when I was eight years old, spending an unusually happy day decorating the, the Christmas tree with the promise of watching the annual holiday specials like Frosty the Snowman or How the Grinch Stole Christmas in a Charlie Brown Christmas Story only to have her fly into a rage for some rule violation like not closing the kitchen cabinet and then spending the rest of the night taking all the ornaments off the tree and dragging the tree to the backyard. Hopes destroyed, expectations crushed, and lips punch swollen. This was the home of my upbringing. Now, when most children begin to, to speak around the ages of one or two years old, I did not. Perhaps it was because there was no predictability to the behavior of my mother and any given word or deed could seemingly set her off. And so for the sake of self-preservation, I think, I, I kept my mouth shut. Or maybe it was just as simple as a fact that my small body was besieged with stress and anxiety every single day. And the havoc this wreaked on my mental, emotional, and physical development prevented me from learning this essential function of human communication. As I gradually grew older, I slowly began to open my mouth and develop my ability to speak. However, I tried to do so. I, I developed a debilitating stutter. Not a single word or phrase would leave my mouth that I wouldn't hear someone laughing at me, teasing me and calling me dumb and stupid. 
You've got to remember this is back in the late 1960s and early 1970s. Back then, a speech impediment was considered a learning disability. Teachers and educators simply did not understand what we know now to be true. That, in fact, the vast majority of stuttery problems are a result of some form of trauma and not at all due to learning disabilities. But because of the lack of awareness at that time, I was immediately labeled slow and disabled. It's funny because I, you know, I, was, I wasn't slow and disabled until they told me I was. So much of our programming is done that way. On the playground of life, kids can be cruel and kids at my school had a field day with me. Hey, d -d -d dummy. Hey, st -st stupid. They would call out every day as I walked past the schoolyard on my way to and from school and during every recess and lunch hour on the playground. I remember every day around 10 o'clock in the morning, the school secretary's voice would sound over the PA system. Please send Paul Martinelli down to the special education room. As I stood up from my desk in my homeroom class, I would hear the snickers and laughter from my classmates. And as a five, six, seven, eight-year-old, what, what do we think this did for my self-image and my self-esteem? You have to understand something about the development of a child's self-image and belief system. From the very moment our life begins, each one of us is programmed to believe certain things about ourselves about our world, about our potential, about the potential of others, about what is possible, and about what we can and cannot do. And until the age of seven to nine years old, which is when most kids begin to form the ability to reason, we take anything that is told to us and we accept that as truth. But not just any truth, but our truth. As those kids were calling me dumb and stupid day after day after day, as those teachers were installing in me that I was slow and that I couldn't learn, as my mom would compare me to my siblings and make comments that I would never be as smart as them and I would never amount to anything, I was seven years old at the time, that is what I internalized as my truth. And it formed the core of my self-image and my self-belief. When you believe a certain thing to be true, it shows up in your behavior, period, end of story. Our beliefs drive our behavior. So how do you think a little kid who believes himself to be dumb and stupid will behave and act? Of course, in a way that proves this belief to be true and that serves to reinforce it further. It was a vicious cycle, seemingly unending and unbreakable. I believed it to be true. The kids all around me told me this was true. My mom berated me with comments that it was true. My teachers had lower expectations of me and for me, and I rose to those lowered expectations. I didn't pay attention in school. After all, what's the point if I can't learn anyways? I started skipping classes, and I failed test after test after test. And through all of this, I simply reinforced for myself the belief over and over again that I was indeed dumb and stupid. I created a learning model of marginalizing myself and diminishing myself. I would actually say things about myself, like when God was handing out brains, I was first in line, but then I had to hold the door for everyone else. <laughs> this kind of self-deprecating humor was not humor at all. It was a brilliant model of self-preservation. I would say hurtful things about myself first so you would need to. What a brilliant strategy to protect myself emotionally. At the ripe old age of 16, I dropped out of high school, although truthfully, that is, to put it kindly, I was called into the principal's office and told in so many words that my educational career had come to an abrupt end, that based on my current trajectory, I would not graduate high school for at least four more years. Apparently, Mount Lebanon High School did not favor having 20-year-olds in attendance. That was the day I also found out that in my home, when you drop out of school, you also move out. I found myself kicked out of my home and sleeping on the floor of a karate school that I had joined years before. Once again, my behavior proved that what I believed about myself to be true, that I was dumb and that I was stupid and that I couldn't learn and that I would never amount to anything. This is just part of the introduction to the missing chapters of Think and Grow Rich. 
I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what challenges you have in your life. I don't know what limitations you have. I don't know what you were programmed to believe about your potential, about things that you could or could not do. But I do know this about you, that you have infinite potential, that you were created by God, G-O-D, the grand overall designer. And as your birthright, it's dominion over all things. Abundance is your birthright. And if in any way you feel that you've been playing small in your life, if in any way you feel that there's something that's holding you back, I know that the principles that I share in this book can be the key to unlocking your life. Thanks. Be well.